can start. We're going to be very strict on time. So, first of all, I recommend everybody to this panel entitled Geographies of Anarchy. This is going to be a bit experimental in the sense that uh, the three papers gather in this panel are sort of heterogeneous, but they uh, come from uh, a common question. Uh, why a panel on geographies of anarchy? I mean, the starting point of uh, the, the reflections, which uh, finally crystallized into what we're going to have in the next uh, uh, two hours, is, uh, is a basic question. Why are there so many geographers who are anarchists and vice versa? To walk into the group. Is it because they have to do with physical space? and therefore are more easily led to realize how arbitrary state boundaries is? Or is it because they live in that space, which is a no space of utopia? That's another possible uh, answer. If this is true, if it's true that anarchists uh, have a, a sort of peculiar relationship with space and with the, the, no, sp the no space of utopia, how does <coughs> this change in an epoch of globalization which, as we were discussing yesterday, tend, so to speak, to give rise to uh, a contraction of space up to a point that somebody has claimed space no longer exists. In order to deal with the question, we have put together Stephanie Wakefield, uh, she's a PhD candidate in Earth and Environmental Science at CUNY, so uh, somebody who's dealing with space on an everyday basis, and she works at the intersection of philosophy and geography, and uh, the title of her, of her talk is going to be Two Tasks for Geography Without Scale, Rethinking Site Ontology. This is going to be our starting point. We then have Alberto Toscano, who uh, I guess is going to deal with uh, the last part of the, the question, uh, how globalization and contemporary capitalism changes uh, <coughs> to space. Uh, Alberto, I met Alberto in Nottingham, where he gave a very beautiful uh, talk on the recruit, so I guess space must also have been at the center of his uh, thinking about these issues. Alberto teaches uh, uh, at Goldsmith, at the University of London, uh, and is, uh, um, besides being uh, one of the editors of the journal Historical Materialism, so another black and red uh, person, uh, he's the author of, of uh, a very beautiful book on the concept of fanaticism. And this brings me uh, to our last speaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Duncombe. Uh, I met Stephen uh, by reading uh, uh, another beautiful book, his book on dreams. Uh, are people uh, dreaming fanatics? Uh, this was one of the questions we dealt with. Uh, Stephen is going to speak about the anarchy of the no place. So, uh, the issue of utopia. Whereas, sorry, I forgot to give a better title, which is The Logistics of Capital and the Spaces of Anarchy. So, Sorry for the long introduction, but I thought it was important to explain to you uh, what is the background uh, of these uh, three uh, different papers. So we begin with Stephanie, and then uh, after 20 minutes, we have uh, Alberto, and then Steve, and then a final Q&A. Okay, thank you. Uh, and also to the other organizers, Simon and Jacob, for asking to talk. <coughs> Anarchism is difficult to encapsulate, but in spite of its reluctance to be pinned down and its heterogeneity as a theory and practice, I think David Graeber succinctly and accurately sums up the politics of contemporary anarchism as, quote, <coughs> the horizontalist, direct action-oriented wing of the planetary movement against neoliberalism, end quote. And the definition provided in a different context by Simon Critchley actually mirrors that of Jacob in the sense that I'm going to be talking about in my paper. For, for Simon Critchley, anarchy is, quote, the creation of interstitial distance within the state 
the continuing questioning from below of any attempt to establish order from above, end quote. In both definitions, one of an anthropologist and another of a philosopher, anarchism is inextricably bound to a horizontal spatial imaginary that posits an up-down power from above against a power from below, a radiating out from here spatiality of horizontality. This spatial imaginary pervades most conceptual frameworks associated with anarchism, whether decentralization and decentralized networks put in opposition to the perceived centralization of power or authority, <clears throat> for example, as in the anti-globalization movement's demands to disperse economic and political decision-making power amongst everyone opposed to a centralized few. Um, or you could take equally, equally strains of anarchism which posit creative and autonomous action in opposition to oppression or repression. You could also take anarchism's ethical proponents who oppose domination in all forms, whether at the level of society, individuals by other individuals, or even nature. Whether framed as collective self-organization without centralized authority, anti-hierarchy, anti-centralization, anti-state or anti-state form, anti-totalitarian or pro-participation, pro-self-management, um, or pro-self-management, spatial modifications of an existing plane of reality composed of hierarchical and horizontal lines of things are always both a means and an end for anarchism. Such scalar ways of thinking. Such scalar ways of thinking are problematic for at least a few reasons. Reasons which have been the object of the aptly named scale debates within geography recently. Several thinkers are now arguing for the elimination of scale entirely from within the field of geography for many reasons, but some of which include uh, the fact that scalar frameworks are marked by a sort of methodological perspectivalism, which is problematic both because it operates at the level of representation and also because it's subjectivistic. I'll talk more about this. The archetypal scalar framework also operates within a set of prefabricated scalar levels into which accounts of the world can be asserted in frameworks for politics dedu deduced. <coughs> Anarchism typically argues then for an up there, down here, local, global, small, big, community, power set of relations in, in its framework for thinking politics. Um, in short, anarchism's positing of power as hierarchical leads to a principle positing of its perceived opposite, the horizontal. I'm not going to spend much more time criticizing this, though. I just wanted to lay it out. Instead, I want to look at a different way of thinking space and place as topological. Topology, from the Greek topos, typically refers to notions of place as location, a uh, here, right? And even more typically, it's most often thought of as um, location, as an extension in the container of space, okay? Such as the Cartesian version of topology, which up until the last several decades dominated geography, and which, to be sure, absolutely dominates anarchist spatial imaginaries. The topology of Rainer Sherman, which will be the focus of the talk in the paper, I'm about to go into, however, is animated at every step by a Heideggerian thought of space and place, which is something else entirely. This fault line topology of Sherman's um, is at once a method, the Heideggerian method, and it's also a site, the archaic and archaic site of the deconstruction of metaphysics. It locates a historical moment irreducible to discourse, empiricism, or subjectivism. Um, it's speculative. Faultline topology tra traces grounds and their fishery. It, ask it asks about sites as that to which we belong. It asks about our place, our topology. Sherman's well-known reading of Heidegger, which is a backwards reading, is elaborated through almost all of his writings, including on being and acting from principles to anarchy and the later broken hegemonies. This reading is entirely topological. Topology indexes, <coughs> in this reading, the, the principial epochs and their modes of presencing, thus excavating the roots of the present moment. In speaking of topology, Sherman is drawing upon Heidegger's renaming of his whole project, uh, which he calls, in, in 1969, Heidegger decides to call in 1969, the topology of being. This is a new name he gives to his project. This is a renaming which, importantly, uh, was part of an explicit attempt to move away from the perceived subjective structure of being in time, where the, the project of understanding of the understanding of being is been taken to be a structure of subjectivity, Dothan, is a possible reading. Okay? Um, instead for Heidegger, everything has a site. Objects of science, tools, works of art, politics, etc. And so instead of what or even why, 
the, the site for Heidegger asks questions of how, such as how do things come to presence today, actually, materially, in everyday, concrete experience. Okay? So thus, it's in this way that for Heidegger, topology provides the ability to move away from the anthropocentrism of Dasein. And for this reason, it's not surprising that this method would be compelling for Sherman, whose interest was in many ways to read Heidegger backwards in an anti-humanistic sense. Okay. But so what does Sherman do with the fault line topology? In general, Sherman's is a philosophy of fissures, faults, collapse, and disintegration. <coughs> Speaking geologically about faults, faults are typically considered to be a boundary between tectonic plates, an extensive planar and relatively flat fracture in the layers of rock that make up the ground beneath us. Unlike joints, faults are never clean-cut lines, neatly separating planes just like this, but rather complex and hazardous zones of deformation where rocks have broken and slid. So as I'm talking about this, try to imagine it like that. Fault line topology for Sherman refers to two lines of thought, which converge together to make up what he calls the anarchy principle, this idea that he's most famous for. I'll summarize this idea as I go along. Sherman locates the anarchy principle itself topologically. So the method of topology allows him to arrive at this, this, uh, this principle. This, uh, this site, as he calls it, assigns us our place on a borderline where action is uprooted from being. Okay. And so in order to arrive at what he calls this dazzling, paradoxical principle, he has to first trace its coordinates, which are our two types of fault line topology. Okay, first coordinate, fractured ground. Topology traces the rise, the sway, and the decline of a mode of presence held to a first principle, the argument. Um, Sherman's reading of the epochal principles is of the originary double bind at their heart, the conflict, the chaos of unconcealment, concealment, as he says, quote, the intrinsic contrariety, I can't say that word, <laughs> of being, <coughs> the originary strife, showing, rising, manifesting, presencing, giving, but all that in a fissured mook, in dissension, as appropriation, expropriation, end quote. In this sense, being is fissured, and it's always connected to the possible, to its possibilities. As such, it's marked by an excess, meaning that it must be contrasted with the idea of being as a static present in the present or a locatable place. That. Unity only makes sense, then, on this reading, as a combination of elements, which involve extension and location, of course, to a degree, but not exclusively, and which are not just standing next to one another as isolatable objects and things next to each other, and of course, neither precede the combination in the first place. So the first sense of topology, being is presencing and absencing, and of the need against this to assert an ordering ground, against which all singulars become particulars, thus suturing over the conflictuality without sublation, which is true, as he puts it. Okay. So, in this first sense, the topology is methodological, as I said. It traces the, prince of the, the apocal principles, this measure giving ground that seemed highest for an age, which anchor what we can do, know, say, think, etc. in any given time. You know, following Heidegger and Nietzsche, he says these are, of course, you know, substance for Aristotle, God for the medievals, Christian God for the medievals. And taking up the burden of the modern ethical principle is the cogito, which for Heidegger appears everywhere by dimming down the wild profusion of presencing in order to once again set it on the right. So the first coordinate, the first topology, traces the rise and the sway, as I said, of, present, of modes of presence and the grounds to which they're tethered. Moreover, it delineates metaphysics itself as that historical space, which includes all the epochal principles described just above. The second question that interests fault line topology, however, is one of their decay, and the principles decay. As such, topology, in this sense, asks about the reversals of history and the crises that set upon each principle. In short, it asks about the decline of civilizations and their